What's up dudes, HW here. Yesterday I had to ban somebody for the first time ever from my YouTube channel. Um, they just ended up getting really disrespectful and telling me the channel was a waste of their time and I didn't know anything and I should watch other YouTube channels because they proved me wrong and stuff. I don't know, it was a video about EQ. I, I, what? And I shouldn't have fed the guy, I shouldn't have fed the troll, so to speak, but um, I was trying to answer the guy's question because he had a lot of questions and he had these really, really strong opinions about um, adding EQ to a Kemper profile, to a, um, a Tonex capture, to a neural amp modeler model, to a quad cortex. And his opinion was basically that if you added any EQ, you destroyed the authenticity. And um, that's just not an opinion that I hold, uh, mostly because it's not true and it's not useful. Um, every guitar that you've ever heard has, uh, whether it's recorded or live, is being EQ'd by a sound engineer. EQ is used all the time, post amp, post everything. And so I'm gonna walk through in this video some of the, uh, some examples and kind of try to, try to explain why this is not a good way to look at it. Uh, it it's not a good way to view tone. You should be able to use EQ and you should be able to use it to fit the guitar tone to your, um, to, to, to your needs, you know? Um, so we talk about guitars, we talk about microphones, we talk about all sorts of stuff, but I wanted to give a little context as to where this is coming from, because it's an opinion that's out there that I just think it's really only useful for people who want to hang out on forums and not actually play the guitar and make music. <laughs> HW here, don't stop believing in good tone. Okay, today I want to talk about some misconceptions uh, that I see around the area of uh, modelers and authenticity and EQ. And, you know, in my opinion, EQ is really the most important tool that a sound engineer has, and by extension, a guitar player. Because I, I think we should be thinking of ourselves a little more as guitar tone engineers, guitar sound engineers, rather than just guitar players, because um, what good is a part if it's not heard, it doesn't sit well in the mix? What good is your playing and, and your guitar tone if an engineer has to fight it and turn you down so that you don't step on the vocals, muddy up the low end, uh, uh, compete with the keyboards? Whatever it is, you want your guitar to have a tone that gets heard, because ultimately, music is for the listener. And so I'm always interested in how do we get different tones? How do we get really great stuff? This applies to everything uh, that you might be playing on. Amps, uh, uh, digital stuff, modelers primarily is, is what I like to talk about. So Quad Cortex, Helix, Kemper, anything. Today I'm using Neural Amp Modeler. It's a free open source plugin. There's no reason you haven't downloaded this yet. And I'm using the Tone Junkie stuff, Match Chi 4 and 69 Marshall 412 Normal. This is a greenback with a 121 and a 545. That's all important because I believe this authentically is the tone of that setup, that rig. It sounds really great and it sounds like this. <laughs> Okay, now that sounds authentic. That sounds real to me. That really does sound like the amp. I own the amp, I'm familiar with it. Neural Amp Modeler does such a great job sort of capturing, um, they all do a great job. So many of them do a great job. And Neural Amp Modeler does such a great job of capturing really the sound of that amplifier. And IRs, of course, like that sounds like the cabinet. That sounds great. But what if I come in here and I turn on a little bit of this EQ? This is one of my favorite things to do, is to use a high shelf and bring down some of the high end. This high-end roll-off can be a very desirable sort of uh, uh, characteristic of guitar, especially when you talk about getting the sound of older, more vintage recordings, classic rock, even some older hard rock. Um, it's just a very pleasing thing to have a nice roll-off in the high-end. Now, I'm not using a cut because I don't necessarily want to get rid of all my um, high-end, you know, after a certain point. Um, you know, I, I think there's an appropriate amount for this cabinet and everything and these these microphones, that's why I chose them, the R121 and the SM545. I like that combination together, but I, I might want to voice this just a little differently. So one more time, here's my tone without it, and then here's with this cut. And this cut is, you know, about 33,000, 3,500 hertz, and it's this, uh, I've been coming down about 3.6 decibels. Let's hear it without it. <laughs> And now 
now with it. Now here's my question for everybody, and this is kind of a philosophical thing, uh, but it's also a very logical thing. Did I just ruin the authenticity of that sound? I mean, it still sounds like the same guitar to me. It still sounds like the same guitar tone. It doesn't sound like something else. Do you know what I'm saying? It doesn't sound like uh, my Strat just because I, I, I made it brighter, you know? It doesn't sound like this guitar, which I'm gonna plug in for you right here. Um, you know, here we go. I mean, that sounds like a different guitar. That's a different thing, right? I'm gonna turn this off. They both sound like strats to me. So we haven't, we haven't ruined the authenticity in so much that you can't identify that it's a different guitar. Uh, we, we certainly haven't been able to turn this into like a Fender or a Vox or something like that. So it still sounds like the same character of the amp. It still sounds like a, uh, like a Match Chief, you know, uh, like a Marshall-y kind of thing with some extra high end, you know, still sound, you can still hear a Strat through it. There's this idea that authenticity means nothing can change, and if anything changes, it's worse. And to that, I would just say, um, what a bunch of... I mean, guys, let's really think about logically where we're deriving our idea of guitar tone from. Have you ever heard Jimi Hendrix's amp? No. You've only heard recordings of Hendrix's amp. Even if you heard it live and you heard it through a PA, you heard a microphone picking it up and going back to a soundboard and you heard it sort of regurgitated to you, reproduced and sent back to you through a PA speaker. Now you might say, oh, but it should be out to clean speakers. There's no such thing as a clean speaker. There's no such thing as a transparent speaker. Everything does something and then you have to calibrate going into it. That's, that's the truth. You can go look that up. You got to calibrate rooms. You got to calibrate actual speaker cones. Um, to get that flat response. And even flatness is only flat uh, to a certain tolerance, you know? Uh, and then certainly when someone stands next to you in that room, you've just changed how sound interacts. But that's all very like, like you know, ideas way out there. In terms of actual guitar tone, there's so many things we can do that just do little things like affect the high end here. One is you could change pickups. The other is, you know, Hendrix famously used a very long cable. He would get a 50 foot cable and he would use that and he liked the way he could turn his Plexi uh, or maybe the JTM super amplifier, the JTM 45100 he used early on. And you could, he could use this cable to sort of cut down some of the high end, but still put everything on 10. He wanted the most amount of gain, but he liked that it rolled off some of the high end, probably so he could use the bridge of his Strat and it still sounded fat enough. He didn't need all the extra clang, clang, kerrang because he had the presence and treble on that Plexi on 10 in an effort to get more gain. I, I hear a lot of people say, oh, but you, you, you're, you're modifying um, the EQ and it's after the gain stage. Well, let me ask you another question. Do you think that any sound engineer who sat down to record, do you think Rick Rubin, when he's, when he's, when he's about to uh, you know, be involved in the mix and mastering process of, of Metallica, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, of uh, uh, all the bands, Jay-Z, of all the bands Rick Rubin's been um, uh, uh, worked with, um, which, is, which is endless, I'm only naming a couple, but do you think anyone who's produced uh, Taylor Swift, John Mayer, I mean the biggest records you hear, uh, the guys who are at the very top of their game. Do you think they ever sit down and go, okay, it's time to uh, mix and master this record. It's time to it's time to um, uh, do my work here. Oh, um, excuse me, Kirk Hammett, was the EQ on your uh, uh, on your amplifier was that pre or post gain stage? Oh, it was pre gain stage. Well, then I better not touch your guitar track at all. That never happens. Uh, also, live. I mean, who do you think is on tour right now with John Mayer as the sound guy? Um, one of the best in the business. And 
he has that job not because he runs all of John Mayer's band, an eight-piece band or something, from an eight, uh, uh, you know, an, an eight-channel Mackie board. Because all he needs to do is level it. No, there's a significant amount of EQ that's going to go on everywhere. I'll tell you, I'm not talking about a $40 sound man who maybe gets paid 40 bucks and a couple free drinks to do, you know, sound at your local blues jam. I'm talking about people who do this professionally. For any any professional environment you've ever been in, I guarantee they are EQing every one of those channels. And just just as a matter of practicality. Engineers always dump the low end on the guitar. They always are starting with the idea of where can I fit this guitar? Because sometimes the guitar can get on top of the vocals. And it might be the case that this tone, that tone on top with a vocal running on top of it, that may be too bright. So it might be that the engineer comes in and does this. The guitar's going out of tune a little bit, so it wouldn't be a very good track. But my point is, the sound that the, the music we're making is meant to be heard by a listener. And there's a sound engineer who's later going to come in and manipulate all these things. And they're not going to be held back by this idea of, well, I just ruined you know, uh, uh, Jimmy's Marshall. I just ruined Hendrix's sound. Um, I just ruined John Mayer's tone. You know, why, why would that be the case that you've ruined someone's tone because you've added some EQ? You've made it fit in a track. You know, the funny thing too is there's so many things you can do to just make small EQ changes. So many things that we actually do on purpose. One example would be switching a Les Paul from 50s to 60s wiring. That will translate to just a little more brightness in your tone. How about clipping the bright cap on your deluxe reverb reissue? That's exactly what we're doing there. Um, let's, let's think about outboard gear because uh, some people are going to say, well, you're doing this after the fact. That's all stuff before the amp and then the amp is still authentic. Let's look at a common popular microphone here. Here's the C414. And um, uh, this is a really nice, uh, cool condenser microphone that a lot of people use by AKG. AKG. Um, Right on the microphone, it has an EQ. You can actually hit this button and cycle through not only a level to pad the mic down, but you actually can dump the low end, 40, 80, and 160 hertz. My question to anyone would be, what's the difference whether you do that here at the microphone or you do it somewhere else? John Mayer uses an SM7B on his live rig and has for years. It's a great microphone. It's one of my favorite microphones. I've, I've started using it once I saw him using it and I tried it out. I think it's perfect on Fenders and uh, Dumble-esque amps. I think it really has a great voice. That microphone actually has the ability to do what I'm doing right here, right on the microphone. You can dump the low end and you can change, there's a, like a, a, a mid boost, you know, kind of a, a hump that you can put in or leave it flat. Those are EQs in the microphone. Those are all post. Those are all after. How about whether you choose a Neve or an API or um, or uh, like an an, uh, uh, an SLS or something? Like, there's all these preamps that we choose because we like what they do to the sound. We like that Neves have this breathy, smooth, silky high end. All those adjectives are pointing towards a character that is an EQ curve, and it is an EQ curve. It does affect the EQ. That's how companies. Um, uh, that's how companies are able to sell high-end plugins um, and uh, like UA and sort of model the sound of an of a, a, a 1073 or an 1180 or um, or any of these like you know high-end microphones or here's the sound of a 121. We also use microphones like 120 like an R121, a Royer 121, or a Fathead um, from Cascade. Uh, that ends up giving us signatures. Why is it called a fathead? It has a ton of 500 hertz frequency in it. And that's, that's notable because we are adding those things to our signal chain to get their sonic quality. We like what they do to the sound. And we never consider that ruining the guitar sound, ruining the Marshall sound. We don't consider that sort of killing the tone. And yet we do whenever we come in and do a little EQ like this. So I would just remind everybody that every record you've heard, 
recorded and all the instruments you've heard live, I guarantee you they've had some EQ like this. Now, whether it was a digital or analog EQ, it most likely was digital if you've listened in the past 40 years, but EQ is your friend. You're not destroying the authenticity. Now, if you go crazy, you can ruin your tone, but maybe that will lead you to more creativity as well. And that's what this is all about, creativity and making music. I guess at the end of the day, I just think of it like this. What if it weren't sound? What if it wasn't a guitar? What if instead it was a blank sheet of paper and we used crayons? Some people say there are this many colors, and there are. But that's not the only colors there are. You sure, you could make great music with this amount of colors, but for some people, if this blue, if this red, if this green gets a little too dark or a little too light, it's ruined, it's wrong, authenticity is gone. Okay, but what if I want this many colors? What if I don't just want the primaries, I want the tertiaries too? What if I want this many colors and this many colors? What if I want all the shades in between because that's the art I wanna make because I might find a use for them. I might enjoy trying to use them. I might wanna find the perfect color for that one little bit of the skyline, of the sunset, that one little shade, hue of purple or blue that just seemed to poke out past the mountains, even though the whole sky was orange. And what if you get just the right teal that I would describe as blue and you would describe as green, but we're still seeing the same art because it's not limited in the way our words are, the way we try to describe something. It might not always be accurate, but that doesn't, that doesn't make it wrong. It doesn't make it not useful. This is about making music. It's about making art, not about wasting your evenings on the gear page, arguing about authenticity and this and that. I mean, it's, it's just so silly. Play the guitar.